This is Joanne Jeffries on June 27th at approximately 9.45 a.m. Mountain Time. Dennis, thank you so much for agreeing to be recorded for the oral history collection of the Washakie Museum and Cultural Center in Berlin, Wyoming. We have two goals in mind. First, that our class of 1960 tells what life was like for kids and teenagers in Berlin from about 1941 to 1960. Our second goal is that we share how growing up in Whirlin impacted our adult lives. Would you please tell us your full name? Dennis Leroy Bauer. Was there any other name or nickname that you were known by when you were in Whirlin? Well, yeah, a few nicknames that some of the high school kids put on me, but uh, they're not uh, ones that I would like to tell about <laughs> on this recorded film. Okay. Um, where are you now as we make this recording? I'm at my residence in Orland, and I'm in my living room. Okay. If you weren't born in Moreland, how old were you when your family arrived or and when did they leave? I was born in Moreland. I'm not sure whether I was born in the old hospital where the old, old library used to be or whether it was at the farmhouse in Moreland. So did you live out on the farm? Uh, just for one year. And then your family moved to town? Yes. Okay. Can you remember just thinking about where you did live? What was your neighborhood like? Or maybe the downtown and surrounding area? What do you remember about all that? Well, when we moved to Worland and I started to be aware of the surroundings, uh, there were no houses beyond Grace Avenue. Mm -hmm. It was Grace Avenue, the alley, and then Fields. And then I remember probably after the war, starting down the Grace Avenue, they built the veterans' apartments for the vets coming home, or the, at least that's what they called them. And that's where Dennis Smith lived. Okay. And then coming up the street, going east, my uncle Elmo Graff lived on Grace. Then coming further up this way, there wasn't any young kids at that time. And then next door to me was a family called McCarthy. He was a rancher. And he had a daughter named Vida Jean McCarthy. He was just a little younger than I was, but uh, that's about the only kid I played with when I was real, real young before going to school. Then moving across the street was the Birkin camps. He was the preacher at the Zion Lutheran Church. And uh, his son was John Birkenkamp, but he was about six years older than I was. Then moving further down the street, I remember Bill Barnett lived on the corner of 8th and uh, Grace Avenue. Then the only other kids going up that way that I recall is uh, you, Joni. You lived yeah. across. Yeah, we from, were you lived across from the Alex Haley residence, and I didn't run around with Alex or anything. But uh, 
I do uh, see some posts from Tim on Facebook once in a while. And I don't remember anybody. Oh yeah, Arla K. Capty and I can't remember what her last name was. I believe it was Rogers. Oh yeah, that's right, Rogers. So then if you go down a block or towards uh, Main Street a block, on the far end, Anne Martin lived, mm -hmm. which I didn't, who didn't, I, I didn't play with. Then going down was another block, there were the Murdochs, mm -hmm. and they still, the younger kids of the family still live there. Then down the block a little further was my Uncle Henry Fritzler, who had the conical bulk plant and the gas station. And his youngest son, Bob Fritzler, uh, my mother and dad used to play cards with them, bridge is their main thing. So I got to see them quite a bit. And further down, there was Dr. Curtis and his son, Alden, who was a little older than we are, but he went to a private school. So I didn't see much of him. And then Bonnie Bailey lived down there before she moved over on the Grace. And I'm not sure when Rick Williams moved across from where Bonnie lived. And then, I don't remember either. And then further down, uh, you're all familiar with the name of Kirby. It was the Kirby house and it was one of the bigger ones and bigger yards in town. And their son, Tom, I played with a little bit. And then he uh, was killed in the Korean War. Then next door to that, I'm not sure when Charlie Roberts moved there, but uh, I remember Dwayne and I played baseball, basketball and everything. So that was probably one of my closer neighbors. What a go good memory, Dennis. What a then, good memory. And then going down one more block towards Main Street, uh, on 8th and Coburn or Cobertson, I don't remember which of this, uh, where the Methodist, old Methodist church was. Mm -hmm. Gary Deal lived across from the Methodist Church. And I played with Gary quite a bit. His mother worked for uh, Warren Creamery. And I'm not sure what his dad did. As you talk about all these people and all these different blocks, how many blocks from Main Street actually was your house located? One, two, three, three blocks. So it's sort of like I felt you were three blocks from everywhere. Isn't that amazing <laughs> from downtown or the different schools? Right. Um, you've chosen some topics that you'd like to share and we're going to go in a chronological order to make it easier for our listeners to follow and then take a look at our from your adult perspective. Dennis, did World War II affect your life? And if so, how? No, because my father 
was also a rancher and my mother planted vegetables and things for us to eat that were possibly rationed. And so that didn't affect me at all. And then during World War II, my brother, who was uh, 17 year old, years older than I was, enlisted. And uh, when he would come home to visit, my mother would take pictures. And she also bought me a small Navy uniform. Mm. <coughs> so we could have our pictures taken together. After I grew out of the uniform, it was passed on to Jack's oldest, or uh, Warren's oldest son, Jack. And he had his pictures taken and it was handed down in Warren's family. And then later on is uh, when Jack got married, The Navy suit became his, so he had his kids' pictures taken with it, and uh, possibly with Warren if his Navy uniform still fit after all those years. But uh, and I still have that uniform here at the house. And I think my kids had their pictures taken in it. Too. What a family keepsake. You'll have to have it framed and, and a little story put with it. That, several generations, and that's wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing that, Dennis. All righty. Well, thank you for sharing, Dennis. I appreciate it. You bet. What do you remember, Dennis, about the seventh and eighth grade, like from September of 1954 to 1956? Um, do you have anything about the clubs possibly that are activities at school that you enjoyed? Well, I remember back then we used to have spelling bees at, at school and I was fairly good, not as good as a lot of the kids, but uh, And then I, we got a new neighbor on uh, Grace Avenue. And I think you all might remember him. His name was Scott Putnam. Yes. And he had a bad arm. And I don't remember him graduating eighth grade with us though. So I don't I, know what happened to Scott. I don't have any idea. Do you remember anything about your high school from 1956 to 1960? Possibly any activities you did or how you filled your time on during the weekends and in the summer? Yeah, we, uh, I played basketball. Well, my freshman year, I played football and I found out that was too rough a game for me. So I quit <laughs> that. And then about that time, Roger Utes came to Moreland to coach basketball. So I played basketball. I never made it to the varsity deal. And I remember at lunch hour, Gary Benu and myself and Frank Aldrich and would play basketball between the junior high and the high school. We never did eat lunch. <laughs> and then in the summertime, it was baseball time, which I dearly loved. What position did you play at baseball? 
Well, I played uh, before high school. I played shortstop. And then in high school, I was a pitcher. Did you ever um, watch the pro or the Moreland teams that we had there? Remember the Moreland Indians? Yes, I watched them. In fact, for two years, I was an assistant bat boy along with Bill Cameron. I don't know whether you remember him or not. Mm -hmm. He lived up there next to Foster Song with his aunt. Yes. Well, with all the activities that you were involved in, Dennis, did you ever have an opportunity to watch television? And what programs did you really like? Well, as I remember it, uh, I think we bought a television and it was all snowy. <laughs> and then they put a booster up outside, out by the airport to improve that condition. And I don't remember ever getting more than one channel out of Casper. And then Roy Bliss, who owned a Gulligan Soft Water Company, uh, started the cable net cable company here in Warren. And I think it cost $150 for the installation fee. And I'm not sure what it was per month, but uh, we only got one channel there, but it was much, much clearer. Did, did having television in your home change the dynamics at all or what you and your parents did? I know you said that they had played, you know, cards and stuff. Did the television change any of that? Not really. I think they got it just for me. <laughs> oh, did they? <laughs> Do you remember what year that was? Oh, boy. Boy, I don't. Okay, that's all right. What experience of growing up in Worland created the most impact for your life? For example, your choice of occupation, your hobbies, place to live, etc. cetera. Um, what have you been doing um, or have you been doing anything for your livelihood or your pleasures um, that you dreamed about when you were growing up in Worland? Well, I got interested in cars about my uh, sophomore year in high school. And uh, then I went to work part time in the summer for Bill Lopp, who took over Bob Smith's body shop on 10th Street. And I learned how to do a little painting, a little body work from them. And then later on, when I decided to get married, I worked for Western Motors as a moving wash person. But they knew that I knew how to do some of this work. And there was an old gentleman that worked there that didn't like to paint or anything. So besides doing the car washing and moving and stuff, I uh, would help paint the paint shop. And then uh, this old gentleman, his name was John Knight. He retired. So 
Well, I took over the body shop and uh, worked there at Worcester Motors till 1969. And I Went to work for Harry Swing and worked for him for 25 years running the body shop thing in his shop. I did not know that. That's interesting, Dennis. Where was Harry Swing's shop located? Uh, do you remember where the food liner was? Yes. Well, you go food liner, slurp and burp, and then on the corner was Harry Swings. It was not exactly across from the uh, motel that Tom G owned. Is um, that business still in business today? No. And I then mean, you mentioned. The trucking part of it still is, but that's out north. Oh, okay. Kind of across from where Lord's driving used to be. You mentioned slurp and burp. What in the heavens was that? Do you remember? That was a restaurant. And it had a drive in, didn't it? Yes, I'm sure it did. Yes. And even that name was enough to just bring people in to see what the heck it was. It was I a guess good little. So. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine that in today's world? <laughs> Borland was the eighth largest city in Wyoming when we grew up. Its population more than doubled because of the oil boom. Um, what are your memories of our small town? Do you remember that? We kept adding new classes, new businesses. What do you remember about that, Dennis? Well, I remember when the oil boom came, uh, Orland started to grow south. The first house that I remember being built was uh, Barry Chirac's dad built a house across from us. And then Lundgren's built a house next to that. And Going west from there, Margaret Chastain built a house with her two sons, Ken and Calvin. Next door to that, the Iverson twins built a house. Then further down the road, Bruce Kimsey's folks built a house. And next to that was the Whirling Greenhouse where uh, Leslie Hunt lived. And then going up the street from Chirac's David Viley's parents built a house up there and uh, then uh, across from Sanders Park was uh, Sharon Kleinsmith lived there. Her father was in the wool business he had a warehouse right next to the railroad that he would buy wool and ship it. And uh, then that all filled in. And then it just kept moving north. I remember playing baseball on vacant lots on 8th and uh, Howell Avenue, kind of Kitty Corner from where George Kudis had his big house. Mm -hmm. Over where the Cody twins lived. And then uh, 
somewhere along the line, Dan Haley had some land up there. And Kathy, I don't know how much acreage she had or who else was in on him, but uh, Park Avenue was built. And my brother lived there and Rick Hake lived there. And then Kathy lived up there and then about the sixth grade, Peggy Steele moved from Gary, Nebraska here. I think she lived on Thomas Avenue and then kept going up 8th Street. There was a Jock Jolly and his sister Lynn. And I believe that uh, Dave Christie and Bill Christie and Pat Christie lived there on 8th Street also. And then uh, down at the other end of the block, this was called the Decker Edition. Uh, you remember Dennis Decker? Oh, yes. He came, uh, he left Orland in, after the eighth grade and moved to Powell. And then the Evans Edition got built. And Dean Fredericks lived over there. And Dolores Seaman lived over there. And there used to be an ice skating rink where the new hospital is there. And I remember that my father used to herd sheep down 15th Street before there was any houses out there and down Washke Avenue to the sales ring. You have a fantastic memory, Dennis. I thank you for sharing all of that. Earlier, you had alluded to the um, sailor suit that you've passed through your family, which has become a tradition. Do you have any other traditions that you, your family still celebrates that your parents used to? Well, I know at Christmas time, I got to open one present Christmas Eve, and uh, then I pass that tradition on to my kids because I'd only let them open one on Christmas Eve. And we did the same thing. I just I had the one package on Christmas Eve, and usually that was from our grandparents, and then Santa would come for Christmas morning and all the rest of it. That's a wonderful tradition. Yes. Is there any any food or anything that you had in your family that you still remember that they your mother made? Well, my mother made something that my dad liked. It was called Missouri gravy. It was a lot thinner than most gravies, and he liked it, but it, Nothing that I really cared about. <laughs> but we used to uh, have Thanksgivings with the McCamies and the Fritzers, who were my dad's sisters. Was there any traditional food that you had at Thanksgiving that you still like to have? <laughs> no, it was the turkey, gravy, dressing, cranberry, the traditional. That sounds delicious. As, as you're sitting around chatting with your friends, um, do you remember all the happy times or any particular person in Worland that you remember? Well, I remember a lot of kids that I ran around with that liked cars, like Dick Larger, Larry Swing, and 
Dean Frederick. So, you know, Bill was mostly just talking about good old days with cars and Greg and me. What car do you remember? <coughs> What car do you remember, Dennis? And do you have an antique car that you quote antique that you like, an older one? Well, it's the '54 Oldsmobile that I rebuilt here in the last, I don't know, six years, I guess. I sold all my other ones. I built a '34 Ford. And uh, 1941 Buick. When was the last time that you drove your car? Uh, at our class reunion. What did you do with it at the class reunion? Drove me. And, and we all followed. Yeah, yeah, it kind of petered out. I went up and down Maine twice, but some of them only went once. They look, I, I guess they went out South Flat Road to the. Well, I think we. Restaurant. Yeah, I think we lost. We lost track of where everybody was going because of the stoplights. We didn't feel we should run the stoplights, <laughs> and we just lost. But what a wonderful memory! And it's so nice that you have that car that you could share with us at our class reunion. Do you still keep in touch with any of your friends that you had from your childhood and any memories? Oh, I keep in touch with Burke McDonald. I haven't been in touch with uh, Dick Largen for oh, probably two years now. I guess Bert's the, you know, I used to play a lot of golf together after, after I graduated and learned that I loved golf as much as I loved baseball when I was young. Do you still play golf? No, I haven't played for eight years because of my back and a few things, but uh, I wish I was. Oh, absolutely. Is there anything else, Dennis, that you'd like to talk about in your time in Moreland? Anything that you can think of? Well, I remember that quite a few people from the uh, rural area moved into Moreland, like Jack Segetti, Ralph Segetti's dad, lived out about halfway between Moreland and the uh, Lloyd's Drive-In, and then he built a house over on Golden Avenue. Oh, I can't think of who else moved into town. We also had a lot of friends in Worland that had um, places in tent sleep or friends in tent sleep. And that was a, a good thing. We were just back and forth from Ten Sleep. It was like an extension to Worland. Yeah, we always used to go over there to uh, for the 4th of July. Still do actually to see the parade. I ought to mention one other thing. Before Worland had a swimming pool, we used to swim in the canal. I don't know whether any of you two did. That's where I learned to swim, was in the Washkie Canal. Yes. <laughs> so were you allowed uh, were you allowed to go on the Bighorn Canal? Yeah, that's where we swam. We swam what they call first check, you know, was just down off of 15th Street. Yes. And then the other one was second check, which was behind Newell Sergeant Park. Yeah, we swam at first check. Yeah. 
it, the pool made quite a difference, didn't it? When do you remember when the pool came in? No, I really don't. I think it was about maybe our freshman, sophomore year, something like that. I could be wrong, but I was thinking it was in the, you know, like 54, 55, somewhere in there. I think you're pretty close there. Where was it located? Do you remember? It was located at kind of the south end of Sanders Park. Well, not the south end, it's south west end. Do you remember how long it was active? Or I know it's closed now. Think, Do you remember? I think it was uh, probably a good 15 years, I would have thought. I know the new one wasn't built until the high school, new high school was built. Right. That was built in 1966. So I guess 10 years probably. Yeah. Well, it was quite a boon. Dennis, in closing, for generations to come um, that may listen to your story, is there any words of wisdom that you would like to pass on to them? Or what would you like to have them know about you? Well, I don't know that I can impart any wisdom on today's generation. They kind of have a mind of their own, and uh, I just tell them to follow their dreams and make sure you go to school, and if you can afford it, go to college and get a good education, and if you can't, you want to pursue uh, being a body man or a mechanic or a carpenter, go to a trade school or go to work uh, for somebody that'll teach you how to do that. Now, I also, I, remember, I also remember working at the Conoco gas station when I was in high school. And uh, where was it located, Dennis? It was uh, on 10th and Bighorn, Caddy Corner from the courthouse. Is that where the park is now located? No, no. That's where, next to where John's IGA was, the old oh, okay. IGA. Okay. So you followed your dream, and I think that's a wonderful, a wonderful theme to leave with the past you know, coming generations is follow your dream, as you said. Dennis, thank you so much for sharing everything with us about growing up in Worland. We really appreciate your time. Okay, you're more than welcome.